what's the name of our show? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Large Glass. I'm Todd. I'm Terry. And this is our Tuesday night show where we bring you a new artist or art-related theme to talk about. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm doing okay. We're creeping up on the holiday season. We are. And uh, we're in the holiday season. This we is are the in holiday the holiday season. season. And I, I don't know if you're ready. For having a holiday extravaganza tonight. <laughs> you're going to do that, aren't you? Some holiday cheer. <laughs> you're going to do it. Totally. I think it's we, episode 69. I know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited about that. By the time, you know what? Next week, the yeah. last episode of the year, we'll have done 70 episodes. 70 episodes. Which I'm kind of, I feel kind of good yeah, about. Yeah, I'm psyched about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's see who's here. Carolyn Thau says she's going to be late tonight, but thanks for stopping in to tell us. That's yeah. kind of awesome. Uh, Pumpkin Audrey's here. Ben Hagenbush is here. John Park is here. Hi, everybody. Good to see all of you. Um, should we... I'm going to make a cocktail tonight yes. on the show live rather than pouring wine. Yeah. So I should probably get started on that. We should. All right. So. We have a very fancy setup tonight, too. Well, it's not that fancy. But um, the name is kind of fun. Why, but yes, it is. Why don't you tell everybody what we're having? So tonight we asked our artist what he recommended. And he had mentioned Jack Daniels. So we're kind of going along those lines. We were having hot toddies. And that is in no way a self-referential, self-indulgent cocktail toddy. to reference. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I will say this, though. We've got a little Woodford Reserve. I took the honey out of my own beehives. Now, I don't have the beehives anymore, but I did pull some comb out and extract this for tonight. So this is homemade local honey. Um, so I'm going to get down to business on this. Yes. Um, can you mm -hmm. possibly tell us about this week's pin winner? This week's pin winner was Bill Daddy. Um, I posted a small detail of Grayson Perry's piece, and he got it right away. So he will be getting a pin. Bill Daddy. Bill Daddy. Yeah, you know, I had posted an article on Facebook about Grayson Perry because I've been... Um, looking into some of the uh, people, the other artists out there that are influenced by um, what we what we refer to as outsider art. Now we're gonna be doing a panel discussion, as you know, on outsider art on January 7th for our patrons. And, you know, I love Grace and Perry's work, but I hadn't really thought about it from the standpoint of other outsider art. So, um, you know, this was kind of revealing. I found a cool uh, video where he kind of walks you through you know, the various symbolism in his paintings. And if you haven't seen that on our Facebook page, go over there and look at that. He's really a delight. I really enjoy listening to him talk. And uh, you will really get something out of this. His paintings are really quite beautiful. Um, and um, I have to say, I really wish we had one of those culinary overhead cameras. We will the way next week. He's Pouring in the honey. He's just glazing it over the bottom a of little the honey, tumbler. A little honey in the bottom. Yes. Terry's absolutely convinced that when I pour the hot water in these glasses that they're going to break. I've had bad experiences with that, so I'm a little traumatized. If they do, we've got Budweiser in the refrigerator. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't <laughs> dare do that. Now you, I'm going to no. take it easy on on this. But okay. I will say this. The hot toddy is a fantastic cold weather drink, especially if you're feeling a little sinusy mm -hmm. or if you've got a bit of a sore throat. We don't have that right now, just to be, you know, clear. But um, it is quite nice for that. So I've bought a little flask of hot water. Yep, you have more people filtering in. I hate username 67 says bonjour. That's Glenn Laver too. Yes. Hi, Glenn. Dave is here. Hey, Dave. Um, John's telling us that Justice can, is making old fashions right now. Oh, perfect. Yep. That goes with the theme here. Mom is here. She says we both look great. Oh. Hi. Mom. You're biased, Mom. But thanks. Ooh, this looks lovely. Yes, this is going to be nice. So it does call for typically the rind of the lemon. You're not done yet. Um, the rind of the lemon. But I like I like a good slice. I like to get a little citrus in there. And I think you'll appreciate that as well. Ooh. 
Does the cinnamon need to be grated at all or no? No, not typically. It's going to break down a little bit in the drink. You can okay. stir the honey up with the cinnamon stick hmm. and that will work. Usually you put two in there, but we'll go with one for now. Nice. This is a lovely thing. One more lemon slice and we are good to toast. Perfecto. Okay. Got some lemon juice on the glasses. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Here you go. That is beautiful. My glass didn't shatter miraculously. It didn't shatter. So these are hot terries. Um, uh, hot toddies. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Episode 69. We are really looking forward to tonight. Cheers. Let us, if you haven't already, let us know what you're drinking down there in the chat. We got poster 333 in the chat. Hello to you. And thanks for the follow earlier. I saw that. These are nice. These are really nice. Mm. Okay, my bartending days of yore are still intact. Ooh, they're really smooth, too. It's me. Smooth. Yes. Yeah, all right, a couple other quick things to talk about. So, um, first of all, tonight we have a very special giveaway that we're really looking forward to. We talked about it on last week's show. It is called The Regifter. Mm -hmm. Now, The Regifter is a painting that we featured on our Bad Art Roundtable. Not that it's bad art, it's a sweet little painting, kind of a very strange piece. We're going to show it to you in a minute. But the idea of the regifter is it's like the white elephant gift. The back of the painting is actually signed with the signatures of all the people that have owned it over the last 20 years. If you win it tonight, we are going to sign it over to you and ship it to you. And then, isn't that supposed to be heated? It, it, it is. is heated. The water that I poured out was actually just boiling not too long ago. So it's possible maybe to see my steam coming off of this I don't know no, the camera doesn't like the steam it is heated but the regifter is going to be somebody's in this chat at the end of the night yeah you do have to be a follower and you will have to enter the raffle now, if you're watching from YouTube or Facebook you will want to come over to our twitch channel which is twitch.tv forward slash Todd Lambrex all one word because that is the only place you will be able to enter the giveaway we like the way twitch's um, functionality works with giveaways so that's why we do that should we show it to him? We should. I'm I mean, actually going to miss it just a little bit, just because we've had it for three years. and. Well, I mean, it is kind of a funny thing. Before. All right, you ready for this? Here's the re-gifter. Yeah. That's not the re-gifter. That's not the re-gifter. <laughs> That's a Frank Holiday painting. <laughs> I can't we give... we had that to give away, we would not be giving that Frank, away. Frank, I'm giving your painting away for crying <laughs> out loud. I can't do that. Wow. You know... I often have technological blunders on the show, which yes. I actually really enjoy. There you go. The regifter. That's the regifter. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this. It's like this one-armed boy in an oversized pair of underpants jumping through a sprinkler. Okay, odd enough, but check out the back. The back has signatures from more than or approximately 19 years. So Yeah, it has a history. So and you have to, if it. you get this painting... If you get this painting, you have to agree to give it away, right? And up the time frame from which you give it away is up to you, but um, so be it. All right, so in a couple of minutes, you're going to see some instructions show up in the chat for how to get involved in this raffle. It's fairly simple. What you're going to do after I start the giveaway is you're going to go into the chat and you're going to type exclamation point raffle, all one word, space, and a number between one and 500, which is the cap that I set for viewer loyalty points tonight. So um, that will be up to you. The more of those viewer loyalty points you spend on tickets, the better the chance you have of winning. If you've won anything in the last 30 days, we ask that you don't enter the giveaway. So um, I think we should make an exception for tonight. You do? Yeah. So everybody can jump in? I think everybody should be able to Fine. jump in. Fine. If you've won something, it's Mom's like... It's the holidays. Like, it's the holidays. Mom's like, I want that. Mom, I've got a feeling about you tonight. You haven't won anything in quite a while, and you are notorious for winning our our things. So I have a feeling you might, you might be the scorer tonight. All right. So exclamation point raffle, all one word, space, and a number between 1 and 500. You will be entered in that raffle. We will be giving that away at the end of tonight's show. You have to be here to win it, okay? So, anyway. So, anyway. Do we have any other business to discuss? Um, we have the call-in show coming up. We do. Next week. It's our end of the year 
celebration. So we're going to have people call in and talk to us live on the show. Well, it's, you know, and it's also kind of got a really uh, interesting bent to it. So mm -hmm. we're going to be discussing a number of topics, you know, that are somewhat show related or you related. Like, for example, we were hoping that something we did inspired you to support art this holiday season or to go out and start an art collection or to just buy a piece of art in general to sort of make that leap. And so we're hoping that maybe you have a story to tell us about how you supported an artist in, in on one level or another. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about failure because mm. we've had a number of those along yeah. the way. A um, lot. A lot. I'm, I'm even thinking just right now with the regifter. So it's 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 all part of the process. My glass didn't shatter. The glass did not shatter. So that's good. <laughs> Small victories. Yes, it's mm. good. All right. So we're hoping that during that show next week, you will be able to call into the show and talk to us live on the air. It'll be fun, but uh, we'll let you know how to do that in next week's show. So should we get to introducing tonight's artist? Because we've got a lot to we talk can. about, and I'm excited. We do. I feel like all the stars have aligned. It's the winter solstice tonight. It's the eve of Jean-Michel Basquiat's birthday. It would be tomorrow. Mm. It's the holiday season, and we have Frank Holiday with us tonight. We do. So give us a give us a little background on so Frank. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. He's a recognized and celebrated artist, and actually his career is going into its sixth decade. Um, he was educated at San Francisco Art uh, Institute, New York Studio um, School, School of Visual Arts. He's got a BFA that was awarded to him in 1979. He also attended acting school at the William Esper uh, Institution. His career came to life in the 1970s when he moved from Greensboro, North Carolina to New York City. Um, Holiday has been featured in numerous solo and group ex exhibitions, both uh, nationally and internationally. Um, some of them of note is the Carlo Bellotti Museum in Rome, as well as MoMA. Um, he's also been featured in a variety of publications, including Hyperallergic, uh, Art in America. Additionally, he has achieved uh, numerous uh, grants as well. 2015, the Guggenheim Fellowship. 2010, he won a Polly Krasner Foundation Fellowship. 2010 was also the Gottlieb Foundation Fellowship. And in 1986, um, a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. He's also a teacher and an actor an art historian of sorts, and so, so much more. We are pleased to present Frank Holiday tonight. Welcome, Frank. Hi, Frank. Grant me the serenity to accept. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. I was just reading my <laughs> AA big book. Um, don't mind me. Hi. How are you? We're great. How are you? <laughs> I had to do that. I'm sorry. I love that. You know, when the, when the camera came on and you've got that book open, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, you know, we got to have an opening act, right? Oh, my we God. Do. That was brilliant. I love it. How are you guys tonight? We are doing well. We're doing great now that you're here. Yes. Oh, I'm glad to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. And it's been a long, I mean, I mean, you know, you and I have had a lot of run-ins in the halls together in some of our teaching environments, but I haven't had that opportunity in so long. So I feel like- No, I've, I miss you. I, I miss, miss you there. You. I, miss, I mean, yeah. I kind of run in and run out with like, you know, a, a, a trench coat, a wig and big sunglasses so I can like <laughs> get in and out of there without anybody seeing me now. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. I do. I do. And and you know what? When I'm back on campus in the spring, I will also be wearing my wig and trench coat. So. Well, I'll be looking for that. Okay. Good. 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 So uh, so we've got a lot to cover tonight, we have and a lot you know to cover. I'm I'm excited to go over this stuff. Yeah, I um, do want to put the reminder out to people: if you have questions, start typing them in the chat as we go along, and eventually we'll get to them. Yeah, we try to be really good about covering all the questions as they come, and we will relay them to Frank uh, as quickly as we can or appropriately as we can, depending on like what we're talking about. So so there is that. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, let's see where to begin, where Frank, to where begin. to begin. We've got we've got a piece of yours up and we've got a whole host of things to talk about tonight. You know how we are, though. We're super laid back. We kind of like approach this from the standpoint of, well, 
let's just talk about your work and let's talk about your making and your life and what you do. Hey, uh, I'm ready. Just ask me anything. I'll talk about it all. Whatever you want to know. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, you want to start us off? Um, well, I think in develop, like usually when we go on the show, we have the artists kind of, um, not dictate, but they kind of lead us down a path of how they want to start and what they want to cover. And you were so open. You were just like, whatever, my life is fantastic. I, we should really talk about everything that's happened along the way. So we thought that we'd just show some of your present work, the stuff that you've been working on for a lately bit. for a bit. Okay. And then we're going to kind of take a little trip down memory lane. So. Aww. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's wise to set the stage with the work that Frank is kind of doing now. I agree. I agree. So that hopefully that we can see a trend and see how you've evolved in your career. Right, right. And a quick hello to 63 who's out there in the audience saying, I guess we got to go dry now after Frank was reading. No, baby, drink as much as you can for as long as you can. Enjoy it. So, Frank, let's talk a little bit about some of your current work, just so our audience can kind of get an idea of what you're up to right now before we kind mm -hmm. of take the time machine backwards. Um, and the piece that we have up on the screen right now, um, I've got a few other pieces like this. But Well, that one is, um, you know, that was for my last show in Chelsea, and it has a funny story. Um, my next door neighbor is Florent Morelet, and you know he had that incredible restaurant Florent in the meatpacking district. And his father is Francois Morelet, the famous French artist from the '60s and '70s. And those panels were actually in a show in Soho, and he put minimalist, uh, minimalist panels in sex positions. And it was about uh, the orgasm. The show was about the orgasm. So he was taking minimalism and, and making it the body. Well, Florent and uh, his wife gave them to me and asked me to incorporate them in a piece. And so I did that piece. And it's about gay men having sex in the woods having to hide in at cherry grove wow and so it's people so it's and it's also based on the um a titian painting called the hunt or a antigone and diana and, and you and you titled this one the hunt correct mm -hmm. yeah the hunt yeah so and yeah so is it multiple panels because i sense that there yeah, are themes there's, there's five, five, panels. five panels so i though what i did is i it's like gay men having to stand up in the woods next to each other. And so I just took and inverted his sexualizing minimalist structure and brought it into, you know, gay, um, gay art, you know? Huh. God, I love, you know, I, I love that. Well, number one, the, the, I love this idea of them having to stand up and this, mm -hmm. the, the vertical arrangement of the panels. But then there's also this kind of fiery energy, right? Mm -hmm. There's this other kind of thing happening there that kind of, you know, if you were not told the subject or, or, or the impetus for the making, it, it might go unnoticed, which kind of is like somebody in the woods having sex, yeah. right? Because it kind of well, might go unnoticed. Well, that's what it's about. It's about ha gay people having to hide, you mm -hmm. know, in mm -hmm. the woods. But also at the time, all those California, when I was painting that, those images of the California fires that were so devastating were mm. just burned into my brain. So kind of all, almost all my paintings went red huh. gotcha. uh, because they were such devastating um, images. I couldn't, they just entered into the, into the painting and into the color right. of what I was doing. Right. So, and so, you know, when I move on to something like this, I think we're yeah. probably on the same track, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, fire is a big, is a big, um, cause it's so beautiful and so deadly. It has those combinations that I love danger and beauty, mm -hmm. and terror, and, you know, mm -hmm. so I love that. Mm -hmm. Right. I think um, when I was watching Christian Ewan's uh, art talks on you, you had said a couple of interesting things about beauty and taking your paintings to the edge and allowing the viewer to bring a lot of their own stuff to it, too, because mm -hmm. that's part of the whole process as well. And when we're looking at these paintings, too, 
um, and hearing you describe them, they weren't quite anything what I was um, thinking of. They were evoking what I had already thought. I could see the flesh tones, especially in, in number one. Um, I'm curious to see how these panels were positioned prior to you getting a hold of them, because from what I'm, am I understanding this correctly? Were they somewhere else first? Well, no, I, it, Frank. Yes. Uh, Francois Mourlet in the 70s had a show in Soho, I'm not, maybe Leo Castelli or something, mm -hmm. and he positioned them in like sex positions, right. like two okay. people laying on two two of them laying on top of each other and like one standing up and one laying down and one entering from the rear you know okay. he he actually had them as people i mean which was and you know what? his it, he was making a play on minimalism getting rid of the figure and so he took the minimalist structure and made it figurative and not only figurative but sexual and it was just the raw material it was, it was just the blank material okay. he, he was a minimalist wow. neon and neon and minimal huh. white paintings france france yeah france uh, I'm going to keep plowing through some yes, of these yes, right now just yes, so we can we kind of, because we through. find Frank on this show that the time goes by so fast. So you might yes. see me push through some of these a little uh, quickly. Uh, so a palette shift here, you know, because I wanted to show a range of uh, some of your use of color, but at the same time kind of hang on to some of your incredible use of light emanating through these pieces. Um, well, well, the color, you know, I I don't really, I don't plan. I just kind of react as I paint and you know after painting for all these years finally I found a palette you know a palette that works for me that I like that that is basically three colors and black and white and maybe a, a couple of tones are you know warmer or cooler but the, the oh shit sorry <laughs> whoa That's okay the light came down on you uh oh okay uh, you just went mute for some reason, and I'm not sure why. Check it your headset. Might have hit your. There we go. There okay. We go. Okay. No, the per um I, the purple paintings were the were from like the show I did in Singapore, uh -huh. and I really didn't know why I was using purple, but then I remembered when I was uh growing up, I would have to go to church every Sunday. And I was Presbyterian, so there were no paintings. There was only a cross. But we had Tiffany stained glass windows that were purple. Oh. And the light would come, and I would just, I was mesmerized by the purple light and the light coming through the stained glass windows and bathing all of the Christians in purple. Huh. And so I think that's why I started using purple, that purple. I wanted to get that kind of, uh, that that light, that mm. Tiffany clear light. That's a fantastic story. I love the way certain, uh, the essence of certain images impacts you as a child and how that sort of plays out further mm -hmm. down the road. That it wasn't about the imagery in the window. Mm -hmm. It was about the color and the way the light the passed through that light. and bathed you in mm -hmm. that, which is just, that, to me, that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna keep going. We've got, I've just got a few, few oh, more that we're gonna just look at really quickly just to set a stage. Um, when you're talking about the, um, the notion of light in the painting and this energy that exists in the painting, what are you thinking about nowadays? Because when we go back down the road, like the painting behind you, for example, in your uh, video feed right now, that's, that's an earlier piece of yours and is a very different kind of painting. So now these paintings seem to embody this kind of, um, this, this very exuberant energy, this very kind of, um, um, yeah, uh, an exuberant energy is the best way I can put it right now. Well, okay. you know, I, what, you know, I, I've worked for a long time and um, I, one thing in my work, I've allowed myself to have freedom and to, you know, I've done many, many, I've done film, I've done photography, I've done writing, movies, acting, I've, figurative painting, abstract painting, minimal painting. And I allowed myself in the early part of my career to do whatever I wanted to do and to try not to become a factory and to have a brand. I hate that fucking word. And and of course that drove everybody crazy, but eventually um, it, I, I about 
about age 40, I started making these paintings. I went, I was in a show in Australia and I was, uh, I was there for six weeks and I ended up doing watercolors on a cliff overlooking, um, uh, the Pacific ocean. And I started painting weather and I started painting sky mm. and, and I was kind of a studio artist up till then. And all of a sudden my whole idea of change was very important so that it doesn't become a, a, a formula. And then as I was painting the weather, I, it was like, oh my God, here's all my color theory. Here's all my space. Here's all of the atmosphere. Here's all of the chromatic color and weather changes all the time mm -hmm. so it was kind of like this idea went off um i mean it was funny i would sit there and do watercolors and i remember these like tourists came up and they were like oh look an artist he's painting look and they were like can we come and see and i was like sure and then they, they came and they looked and they said what is it <laughs> 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 I knew <laughs> I knew that I was doing so I was on to something. Right. So um so that's I mean so then that's what I I mean before I was like brought up with all the Greenbergian and formalist painting and the neo expressionism and all of that and at some point it became very abstract and I was like well how do I tie it into my life now like I wanted to make it about something that I was going through and there was a you know at one point I, they were gay, they gave me like three months to live right and so during that three months where I was going to die I really started like what what what's important I mean it's not like you know who's showing in Chelsea or you know, it was like, oh, my God, look how blue the sky is. Look how, look at that cloud. Look mm. how pink that is. Look mm -hmm. at the flower. Look at the inside of the flower. Yeah. Look at my boyfriend's, the color of his eyes. Look at the, how the light falls on a peach. It was like I wanted to start tying all the abstraction into, you know, me, like how I respond to things, how, what beauty is to me and what it means to be alive. Because for a long time, my work was about, dying and AIDS. I mean, I'm of the AIDS generation. Everybody died. I made so many black venereal paintings. And, it, and so then, of course, the AIDS drug saved my life. And I started like, well, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to live? And that's kind of what changed my work and to the direction I've been in for like 25 years. I love you that. know, how do, how's it, how do you make something about actually being alive? And these paintings are alive and, and, and I feel you can feel that. And so that that's perfect in terms of, you know, when I'm thinking about that energy mm -hmm. and that internal light, that's that's perfect. I, I do want to say really quickly, there's some comments that have been flying by in the chat. So I want to kind of get to those, All right. um, which uh, there's a couple here. So uh, Ben Hagenbush is wondering what medium you use, which uh, I believe is um, 63 answers that he goes i think these are mostly oil on linen from the website info is that right frank they're oil on linen and i use a uh, old master um i use damar stand turpentine and a uh, cobalt dryer and there there are many 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 layers it's basically glazing this is kind of the the work that i'm working on now i use i, I use palette knife i use thick paint thin paint glazes and I build up the kind of tones by putting washes of color and you know they take me like eight months to make them look like they took three minutes but it's you know you're building up tone and you're building up form through the layers and through the marks and mm. and you have to find you by the act of making it you're you're finding the image you're finding the painting but I've all I've used this medium it's kind of a uh, a fragile me um you know me uh medium but i love it because it it's like stained glass you know it is mm -hmm. it is uh pumpkin audrey is asking if you work on more than one piece at a time yeah i do i i have to i work on like 10 at a time or, or as many paintings like i went i had to do a show in rome 
and I was there for nine months and I had to paint 30 paintings in for a museum show in nine months oh, oh my gosh. god yes wow. and so I did it and so I worked on 30 for nine months and then it was it was it was shown at the Bellotti, uh the Villa Borghese Carlo Bellotti Museum and you know I I was like a uh in a cave for nine months so yeah I do I work on you have to you have to you know, I used to work until I would like ruin it. And now it's like I work until it starts fucking up. And then I go to the next one and I go to and I rotate them. And then eventually I build a body of work through rotating them so that I never overwork any of them. And I would assume by fucking it up, what you mean is that they begin to muddy just enough that you realize you got to stop and let that glaze sort of lay down and do its thing before you move on to the next one. It's all wet, wet on wet. And, you know, you put the wrong color on, you get mud. And what you're yeah. doing is you're having to really like formally go through prismatic color theory in order to, you know, a red can go on top of a, if you put a red on a yellow, it's going to be orange. And then how do you bring it towards yellow or how do you bring it towards it's cool right so it's you know it's scientific it's there is scientific uh process to it or either i put too much and i get too angry and it becomes muddy and then the mud it just becomes opaque and doesn't work in the i want that inner light in a painting that's kind of what i've worked for right right um, let's see. Glenn Lavertu says, all of these are the most lush, delicious, orgasmic paintings I can think of. They leave me breathless and I want to swim in them. Tell them to give them my number and come over. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, you've been formally, Glenn, you Just have been kidding. formally Thank invited you. to Frank's house. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, you know, I do, I, they are about having sex really i mean people ask me what my paintings are really about they're about the orgasmic experience i want them to be the climactic experience of you know how i mean not even like just sex but you know like how you walk around a corner you'll look up in the sky it's a blaze of the most beautiful sunset and yeah. then you look at your watch and then you look up and it's gone but yet there is a peak experience that you experience yeah. as a person yeah and that's what i try to bring is a peak experience for you to look at and you know occasionally i'll get there you know i i'll get there because i want the viewer to look at it and to have some kind of visceral response to the work and to have their own experience. Um, I want the, someone asked me once like, well, what do you want the viewer to feel? And I said, I want the, the viewer to feel beautiful, mm. not stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, don't you, do you ever have an experience though where someone feels like they need to extrapolate some deep meaning out of this rather than just a visceral experience? Do you yeah. feel, and, and of course, then it leaves them, sometimes I have found feeling stupid, not with your paintings necessarily, but in the face of something that is abstract because they can't find that. And I've tried so hard to tell my students and my peers that. that you know, sometimes it's really just about the experience of looking mm -hmm. and, and not needing to necessarily take this deep dive down this very long, wordy road. Well, you know, I give them clues. I mean, I use an abstract language, you know, a formal painting language. I, you know, use the abstract expressionist kind of, uh, you know, the that nasty word of I'm a painterly painter. But yet I give them clues into the real world. Like you will get a blue that will look like a sky and will, will, will work spatially as a sky. You will see a brush stroke that will be my body, that will stand in for the body. Mm. It, you can actually feel your body making it. So within all the formal languages, I'm giving you hints of the real world. Gotcha. So I try to give them, I try to give them a, a clue in like at one opening somebody said uh, i feel really stupid but i see a dragon in there and i'm like oh my god where and they said right there i said i see it too and this was like some i don't know he was like some guy that 
had pulled Saddam Hussein out of the hole that he was in. He was some army guy. And then all of a sudden he got it and he could get into the painting and he could, you know, it's like looking at clouds. Look, there's Mickey Mouse. Right. You know, I, that's what I want. I remember lying um, um, when I was a kid. That was my favorite activity was what was the cloud. Yeah. And that's kind of where I want to I go back to. So, of course, I, but I'm not going to tell you what the meaning is. Right, right. No, and you shouldn't. And it's fun. It's really funny. There's a bunch of stuff popping up in the comments right yes, now. So first of all, Ben Ben Hagenbush, <laughs> Ben Hagenbush earlier said, "I see a dragon in this painting." Before you ever said that, seriously? Yes, yeah. he did. It's right there on the screen. Yeah. So that's the first thing. And the other thing that Ben Hagenbush just said, just to keep with his comments, is he just said, uh, "I think it's kind of ironic that this is episode 69," which <laughs> you can't, you know, I'm you, you couldn't plan that, that better. We could not have planned yeah. that better. But, well, uh, that was my second career. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but the but the funny thing about a dragon, when I was, um, I don't know, I must have been like 13 or 14 years old, and I had just started smoking pot, and my parents went out of town, and I painted a huge dragon on three walls of my bedroom in day glow, oh. and I had and I had a black light. And it was like so amazing, this huge, wild dragon painted right on my wall. And and all of a sudden, I noticed that cars were lining up out on the street, like, you know, how they would look at a Christmas, a house at Christmas, this all decorated up. And I, it was, I, I was like, oh, my God, I have an audience. And I was hooked. I was hooked. Wow. So, yeah, the dragon keeps coming back. And it's always been, it's always, it was one of my first images that I ever really painted. Huh. Well, let's see. And 63, one of our com one of our um, chat room members, 63, asked several questions that I've missed. So first of all, he says, why fragile? You were talking about how the medium is fragile. And um, I want to get back to that. But let me just see what else he says so we can lump it all together. He also says, I think, I think those of us in the college level art ed business have been trained out of the validity of beauty which I think is another interesting thing. Uh, and then he just asked, wow, how stoned were you? Um, but there's, so there's several different comments. Very. <laughs> <laughs> there are several different comments in here from him, but on the beauty thing, one of our other viewers, John Park says, there really is a sense that they are emanating light. I also love that you embrace the concept of beauty outright, which is something I think a lot of people, and that, that takes, you know, in this day and age with painting, and the criticism of painting, that's something that takes some courage, I think. Well, but I'll address that. I mean, you know, people would come for the longest time. I was, you know, people would come in and, and give a criticism to my work and then I would change it or I would, I would look for somebody to tell me or I would try to make work that would fit into a certain conversation. I think when you're young and you, you, you want to enter into the art conversation somehow. And I kind of did that through, you know, Club 57 and the Neo-Expressionism and, and, you know, J hello, Jean-Michel and Keith, they were my friends and we all kind of emerged for that. But, but then, you know, you're, you, after, after all of that, I mean, I started getting the criticism of like, oh, they're beautiful. They started being dismissed. Oh, it's just beautiful. Oh, it's just beauty. So I started really reading a lot about beauty and about, you know, Kant and all of the ideas around beauty. And I also, um, you know, I was, uh, the computer came out and I started making computer generated. And then I got over that. And then I got, and so people would come in and say, oh, the criticism was, was beautiful. And then I figured out, that if that is what everybody was pointing out, that is the edge that mm -hmm. I want to sit on. I want to sit on that edge that drives people nuts. Mm -hmm. I want to sit on, you want to be critical. So I'm making critical paintings against, I am not a pop artist. I mean, I work for Warhol, for God's sake. You know, you would think I would, but I'm not. I'm the sunset is my soup can, okay? I um, love that. Oh, my God, I love that. 
So I started embracing where the criticism was. They were like, oh, it's abstract expressionist. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a dirty word. Let's go there. Let's look at that. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's go there. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Let's do yeah. That. And I'm like, oh, really? And that's when it got interesting for me because then I pushed the beauty and I pushed, I, I started pushing against the criticism. And then all of a sudden, at some point, people started responding to the beauty because you know, there's so much information out there, we're bombarded with it, that they would come and look at my painting and say, oh my God, it's not information, it's experience. It's something, it's some, you know, it's, there's something else to it. It's not just information feeding on my brain. And so that, it, that's how I found really what I did is to embrace the criticism. I love that. All right, let's and to make and to make work about shit that Frank likes. Yes. At some point, what does Frank like? What yes. does what does you know? I would look at all this amazing work, and I started like getting a check on my body, like standing in front of a Bernini sculpture. I mean, it was. I'm sorry, he was a master. Yeah. And you stand in front of it and you feel something. And I started going like, what does my body feel like when I'm standing in front of this? Mm -hmm. And so then I want to remember that feeling. So when I'm painting and I start getting that feeling in my body, not that I'm as great as Bernini or anything, but I try to match the sensation that I would get when I'm standing in front of something great. Like there is a, my body reacts to it. Mm -hmm. And I started making work about what I wanted to make work about, what I responded to. Amen. I mean, it's... Love that. Love that. Um, can we take a little ride in the trip? Can we go backwards a little bit? I got a picture to put up here that Terry went and found. I want to see what you think. Can we do that? Mm-hmm. So let's talk about when you left... Oh, my God. When you left for New York. This is the well, day that you actually packed your bags and were heading to New York. I was heading, I was a dancer. Um, I That was in high school. That was when I was in 11th, 10th, or 10th grade. I was a ballet dancer and I had been given a scholarship to Joffrey Ballet when I was 16. And that was me getting ready to go to the airport to go come to New York and study classical ballet and live here. I was 16. What I mean, year, what, what, what were my that? parents thinking? <laughs> what, year, what year was that? <laughs> that had to be 1973. Okay. Okay. And I was at Joffrey. And then one of my friends, my best friend, Andy Reese was here. All my friends were dancers. They were at Juilliard or, you know, all over. And he gave me LSD and took me to Museum of Modern Art. And I quit dance the next day. And even to this day, I'm not sure if it was because I was hung over or because I had gotten a calling. <laughs> but uh. I, I, I decided I wanted to be an artist. I mean, it was a very odd experience to um, to kind of walk into a place and get it and to feel like, um, I get this. I get it. I get I get it. And I felt like a kinship with the, all that work. I still do. MoMA is still very important to me. Um, and those paintings, I felt like for the first time, there was somebody that I was a part of something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I go ahead. I'm sorry. You, no, you're... well, I was going to say, um, when you were growing up, you, you didn't have a whole lot of exposure to art from what I, from what I'm seeing. It sounds like you didn't see a first painting until you were about 17 or so. Well, when I was at North Carolina School of the Arts, we had English and history and art history. It was a great way to learn. They taught the, the history of the period. They taught the literature of the period and the art in the period all in the same course. But it was at Renolda House. And Renolda House, they had churches, Bierstadt's, Rothko's, Ennis's, oh, wow. all the great... I mean, I'm talking about like the huge beer yeah. stats wow. and, you know, we would be like stoned out and just like, yeah, we're stoned, but we're like, those were the first paintings that really, I really was exposed to. And they're all about light. They're all about space. Totally. They're all about, you know, and that was a really big influence. And it still is. You can see it. That's why there's the landscape and the light. I think that's where I really trace it to. Yeah, if you have it, early exposure to Bierstadt like that, that's ob that now all of a sudden things are starting to click. I'm starting to really see it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right, so we've got some earlier pieces up here mm -hmm. as well, some really early stuff. Yeah, it was hard to find some of your early, early, early works, so I was trying to dig up what I could. And I like looking at this with artists because I love watching that evolution of how you came to be and, you know, you're kind of experimenting a little bit. Um, well, this, this, that one was a drawing with, um, was a drawing and it kind of went along with my paintings and I was always into the kind of the all over paintingness of it. And I think like Keith had just burst, burst out on the scene and mm -hmm. was using line and we were kind of like experimenting with like that kind of imagery, all over imagery. That was a very early piece. I think um, a lot of my earlier pieces, um, Somebody broke into my studio and stole about 120 of all my earlier works. That's so. why we can't find them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. No, they're gone. Yeah. And they were, they're gone. That's and um, the, I, I had very few images of them. And so there's not a lot of that around. I mean, somewhere uh -huh. I keep looking and hoping that someday that they'll turn up. The FBI said, if one ever comes up for sale, you know, I can claim it and they'll trace it. Wow. But they can't find them. They look for them for a long time. They're, oh, I don't know where they are. I think it's really important to tell our audience, too, that when you say Keith or when you say Jean-Michel, you're talking about friends of yours, Keith Herring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Keith and I went to, co went to School of Visual. We met at School of Visual Arts. And then along with Ann Magnuson, Susan Hannaford, we opened Club 57 and Jean-Michel, you know, was all a part of it. We were all these young kids, Kenny Scharf. Um, we were all started that club and that's how we emerged, you let's, know. Let's jump right over to that because I think it's really important oh, look, to talk about well, that. Well, this was our band. Um, it was called Youth Against Death. And um, it was, uh, we were a band, but we didn't sing and we didn't play any instruments and we f refused to perform but we got booked all the time <laughs> I and mean, we were the ultimate punk group <laughs> this was one of our our stills from from our publicity stills i mean we literally got booked at places <laughs> and we wouldn't show up because it's fuck you we don't we don't uh-uh no we, we won't do it we didn't even have any songs <laughs> oh, Lord. That's so, so tell cool. us tell us about how these these friends and 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 running with these friends sort of led to the opening of club 57 oh hi there's club 50 well um we were keith and kenny and john sex and i were at school of visual arts and we started hanging out and there was no place to go and then ann magnuson and Susan Hannaford were in the in a bank waiting in line for a bank to, for a teller and they were talking about how they wanted to they really wanted to open a club and blah 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 and the guy in front of him was named Stanley and he had the the space which was the basement of a Polish church at 57 St. Mark's place and he had Irving Plaza the rock and roll club and he said well I have some spaces and so what they did is they decided to do the New Way Vaudeville and the New Way Vaudeville had just everybody in it. it like Lance Loud, McDermott and McGow and, and Lydia Lunch and um, like Eric Mitchell. And, and, you know, it was like filled with the downtown people. And, and, that, and so we all did that show. Um, it was one of the shows where at the end, the whole cast came out and drank Kool-Aid and died. It was great. And um, <laughs> and so we were working, we all, so then they started, that started becoming a club. And then one day, Ann came up to me and Tom, they said, there's this little space. Do you want to come and see it? We're thinking about opening a club. And so I said, sure. So we went down to 57 St. Mark's place. We walked in, it was like dark and spider webs. And we walked in and they said, would this be a club? Well, we, should we open this as a club? And I went, yeah paint it black and we painted it black and we opened a club and we had a membership and you know we didn't have a liquor license but we had a membership and that's where it started and that's where a lot happened yeah, yeah. a lot happened um, yeah this was lady wrestling night which was amazing but it was you know it was an amazing place because 
anybody could do anything and we you could rent the space for twenty five dollars and so keith and i decided to have our first show there and we rent we didn't have twenty five dollars so we decided to charge everybody 50 cents to get in and so we made the money and we actually made enough to go down to the blue door and buy a nickel bag of pot (laughs) that's awesome and we sold everything for 25 dollars I found another uh, image of Lady Wrestling Night, and I'm wondering, oh my God. is that yes. you? Is that you on the left side of that image? I can't tell if that's you or not. On the very We're... on the left side of the image, there's a guy. No, no, no. I'm behind the camera. I was um I was working. I was you know uh, Barry Shields and Steve Brown. We were you know video had just come out like the portable video Mm -hmm. and they were filmmakers they made wig stock the movie and uh, a bunch of other movies and we cut we were covering it um i I liked working with film too so we were i wasn't a part of that but i was a part of filming that gotcha gotcha um we found some ephemera from uh club 57 like Mm -hmm. calendars um that had a whole bunch of events on it which i just absolutely love the way this was put together Um, there's some other sort of poster art from some of the things that you guys were doing. Um, here is something from the go-go stuff that you were doing there. Um, I'm particularly interested in a couple of images here. This one is this. Yeah, well, that's, that's, um, there's, that's, uh, there's behind him is a Jean-Michel Basquiat. I see that. Is that the bar? And that's Ira. Ira, that's the bar. Ira was the manager. There were four different managers. And I had a painting behind the um, bar for a long time, behind the the DJ booth. And Jean-Michel had it behind the bar, too. So, I mean, it was literally just the basement of a Polish church. Yeah. Yeah. And how how frequently was it open? I saw the calendar, but was it... Every I think it was I think every day one day it was closed I think Mondays it was closed but yeah every there was a different event every night and you were basically there every every night doing this you were this was your life well I was doing that and we were also employed the the big club was Irving Plaza and the little club was Club 57 Mm. and like Keith and I were in charge of the back door the kind of like the VIP door to Irving Plaza so we ran that on the weekends so we were never there on the weekends but we were there every night um yeah in the week so yeah well, i i spent a lot of time in that church basement mm. fantastic. and i did lots of sets and lots of performances this is that was keith that was a performance night and we did move we shot movies there we had performance art we did uh we did so much there it was just an amazing time anything went huh. anything went huh. it's it's, a, it's yeah. incredible and that's crunchy and keith I, I i feel like that kind of I, I i don't know maybe this is just short-sighted of me but i'm just like gosh can that happen anymore i mean is that i think it i, I think it you know i in my fantasy there's still kids howling at the moon yeah. somewhere mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah there have to be I mean, like I like a lot of like kids are always like, oh, I wish we had that. Well, I said, well, it's, you're going to have it, but it's not going to be that it's going to you're going to it's going to be whatever your thing is. And you have, don't wait around. You got to create it. I and mean, we created we didn't wait like Soho and the art world was totally would not let us in. They the, the the film people would not let us in. Broadway would not let us in. I mean, you know, Hairspray, the musical came out of club 57 Mm -hmm. you know i mean but though they weren't broadway you know everything came out of there because we just said fuck you we'll do it ourselves it was very mickey and judy oh let's put on a show we didn't wait for for people to give us permission to do it yeah and you know though i love that i sense this theme running through everything you do frank because if you just look at that whole sort of way of living for club 57 right back to talking about embracing beauty in your painting now because it's the thing that drives everybody nuts or it's the thing that really is criticized. I I think there's really something very telling here about functioning as an artist with that as your core ideology. I I think it really leads to some amazing things. 
and, and I love that. I love it's that. not it's not the easiest road, but no. it is the mm. for me it's been very rewarding. Eventually I had to say, this is my career. How am I gonna spend my life? Mm -hmm. What am I going to be? Mm -hmm. I have to be interested and I have to keep myself intrigued and wondering and not knowing. And I don't really want to know what I'm doing. I don't want to know what the painting's going to look like. But I, I, that's the adventure. It's I. It's like jumping off a cliff and not knowing. I mean, that's the rush. I mean, I'm. People ask me like what my paintings are about. They're really about escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like escape. I don't want reality. You know, mm -hmm. I want other the otherness. Mm. And, you know, it's not like total abstraction and floating in space. It's like, I still give you that you're in the world, but it's an escape from all of this. Yeah. Yeah. But so was the club, right? I mean, the oh, club, absolutely. That that kind of becomes um, an escape in and of itself. It mm -hmm. defied it defied norms. It escaped the walls that would not allow you in like it got around them right mm -hmm. it kind of it made its way around those but it wasn't a strategy it was kind of like nature yeah yeah i mean it was like yeah. plants growing where there was a space for them to grow oh. you know how a tree will find its way well yes. i mean we weren't like yes. oh we were just like fuck let's just have fun and let's just it ended up us it having happened. fun. Oh, we were just like, we found people that were all the misfits and we were wild, incredible, creative, wonderful. I feel so lucky that I got to work with all of these incredible people yeah. and that I got to be a part of that. And I got to experience these people and make work with them. And, and yeah, and, you know, and I think I still carry that spirit of rebellion and experimentation and being out of the norm. Like I'm, I don't really fit in to the art world, but I still am a part of it and I still make my work, yeah. you know? But Jean-Michel Basquiat said to me once, I was complaining about like, my work just doesn't fit in. And he said, Frank, it's not about fitting in, it's about fitting out. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was very wise. Sage words. Yeah. Now, can we just go up for one second? Because you did have a couple pieces hanging in Club 57. So, yeah, there's the one. Yeah, um, that that was for a movie. Oh, that was for a movie? You can get this was for Eric Marciano's movie. Um, and it was uh, The Age of Insects. And they asked me to do a painting for that. And, you know, they, they had the eye that they were looking through. And I kind of like riff. I love Insor. And I riffed on an Insur painting there. And then uh, that was shown in MoMA. And I think it was taken into MoMA, I am think. But we put a video, my eye, in a, in a video so that the painting actually looks at you. Mm. And that was done. I actually was given two grams of cocaine for that painting. And it was really funny because it was I was standing, it was in MoMA, and I was like, that's very ironic. Yeah. Actually, I think I saw you talking about that on the video produced by the MoMA. And you're like, yes. oh, I should get Yeah, of course grades. they had a disclaimer saying, these are not our views and please do not be, a, these are not, if you're offended by this, it's not our fault. Yeah. <laughs> I had to have a disclaimer with my interview oh my there. Goodness. Frank was not compensated in drugs for yes. this show. Um, there's a whole bunch of comments I want to run through real quickly. Okay. Um, so can first we, of all, can we pin any of these up on the screen? Oh yeah, I forgot all about yeah. pinning the yeah. comments. Well, I will say that Pumpkin Audrey did say, can we stretch this show out until 10 p.m.? Because she's just loving this. But well, we can do another version at yeah. some point. I think oh, we can. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so let's take a look real quick at, uh, I wanted to put up this one. So Wendy Letvin is here. And she's, hey, saying, Wendy. she's saying, fantastic to hear your story, Frank. I'm so curious how you moved from dancing to painting and how the two disciplines are connected for you. Well, that was a very, very difficult thing was, um, you know, like in, when you're using your body in space, you know, there's discipline, there's repetition, and you're literally filling the space. It's kind of like, you know, how music, you turn on the music and the music knows no boundaries and it just goes to the wall until it dissipates. So with, with the body, you know, the gesture and, and what the body can make and you become very aware of your body and what it can do, that was a very, very difficult 
part of my work was learning how to translate that into like a uh, you know, painting is 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 movement, and how to put that into a static image, and so I had to finally connect, and that's really my my body makes the image. My body. I was looking at a de Kooning, and sometimes people I get the oh de Kooning, and I was looking at a de Kooning, and I was standing in front of it, and I said I, my body would never make that, and so my body. I had to learn how to connect my body to making the marks, and those are my marks. Those are my movements. That's my body. So my body started making the dance. Also, I love George Balanchine ballets. And so I love that whole like kind of like, oh, ballet is so, you know, feminine. And, and I love the light and I love the blue light and the stage light. And so I started looking, you know, what did I learn from Balanchine? What did I learn from you know, dance and the, the theatrical experience and then tying it and that my color kind of comes through with that too. Mm -hmm. And then my body attaching my body to that. It's my mark. It's mm -hmm. my body. My body makes a certain mark. Huh. That's how I did it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. huh, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of our watchers, one of our uh, viewers, Jess Parks says, I love your perspective, Frank. I need to start channeling you into my everyday life. Uh, so you know, I, well, think, I think we all could use that. You can chat. I'll channel you. You channel me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, let's well, see. this was this was a that was at MoMA. That was Kenny Scharf, who amazing. And I'm so proud of Kenny. He's um, he's really f finally getting recognized and getting his due. And I think he's making incredible work. And I just love him. Well, you know, you do a really beautiful job in that video that the MoMA produced of sort of functioning as docent at that show and walking us through it. So for those of you that are out there, you definitely want to go check out that video. You can Google uh, Frank Holiday at the MoMA. Or you can go to our website onto our blog because I posted it there. Oh, that's true. You can yes. go to our blog. That's actually a really good idea. Yeah. So thelargeglass.org has that posted there. And then if you do want to see more about Frank, you definitely want to head over to his website, which is frankholiday.net. Uh, you definitely want to take that one down and head over there because there's so much more information over there. And if you want to follow him on Instagram, uh, it's frank.holiday on Instagram. So definitely look at him there. I've got a few other images of the Rome show. I know we're on 9 o'clock right now. Okay. And I promised that we would kind of wind down at that point. Um, but I have to say, as I scroll through some of these, Frank, this has just been... Oh, wait, we have a question from 63. Um Quick question, is the piece behind Frank his? No, that was a Kenny Scharf piece that was behind no, him. No, I think he means... Oh, you mean in the oh, behind me now? He yeah. means behind Our, you now, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, this was... um, There was a building on 42nd Street, 233 West 42nd, between 7th and 8th, and a lot of artists had studios there. Um, Daka Pill, George, um, Donald Batchelor, uh, uh, Sue Williams, Maura Dreyer, Mike Bidlow, Dana Garrett, Philip Taff. I mean, it was just filled with artists and really cheap. And we were right on 42nd Street. And and Philip Taff and I were, were very, very good friends. And so we did uh, several combination paintings with each other. That was around 1984. Huh. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's beautiful. Uh, you have a uh, first time chat uh, person in here that you may know. Arabrab says, as always, Frank, you are entertaining, entertaining, but with depth. Um, <laughs> hey, if any of you are out there watching for the first time and having a good time here, could you please follow? We've got a host of great live artists coming up in the future, so you're going to get to see more. And I would love to also at some point have Frank back and do part do. Uh, thanks, Arab oh, Brab. That's just awesome. Like so that. Just like Thank that. You. Boom. See how easy it is. You just <laughs> click the little heart and you're good to go. Yeah. Um, Frank, I have to say this has been so much fun. And I realize now more than ever how much I miss you, how much I miss you. Miss you out too. Yeah. It's just great to see you and talk to you. You know, it's um, it's so nice that you're doing this uh this and reaching out and kind of spreading the word and and letting us it's so nice to talk and i've never met terry and it's nice you're so much fun too oh. 
Salt and Thank Pepper. You. So are you. Salt and Pepper 75 says, love you, cracker. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Happy birthday, Pepper. Uh. Happy birthday. <laughs> I'm uh, with, that was Kirk, my dear friend. We moved to San Francisco together in 1975, and we we heard there were some gay people there. And so we got to Castro Street and got an apartment right on Castro Street next to Harvey Milk. Yeah, you knew Harvey I, Milk, right? That was wild. Yes, yes. So I love you, Kirk. You're my baby. <laughs> I will go. always love you. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so Ben Ben Hagerbush says, this was a great show. Thanks to you. Uh, Pumpkin Audrey says, great to meet you, Frank. I love you, Pumpkin. Uh <laughs> Chris Lambrix, who is my mom, says Frank is amazing. Could listen to him all night long. Uh, Jess Park says, love tonight's show so much. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you. You were a hit. And I, I well, thank, thank you so much. I thank you for so having much me. for coming on. So we are going to respect your time and let you go back to doing what you do. But again, thank you so much. We, You're welcome. We, thank you so much. I love, enjoyed it so much. You. It was fun. We love love you. you too. All right. We'll talk Make to you. art, everybody. Yes. 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 Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. Live for long that. and prosper. <laughs> 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 All right. That's, you're really good at that. I mean, that's yeah, like, that's, that's not easy. Oh, look, I could do it too. <laughs> wow. wow. Yes. Well, the, I, I had to. Ann Magnuson had a band called Vulcan Death Grub. Oh. That was that was the sign. Was Vulcan the... Death Grip, man. <laughs> Heavy metal. We played the Ritz <laughs> in front of Jesus Mary Chain. What? We were the no opening. Way. We were the opening band. But you didn't have any songs. Well, no. This, uh, this was her her this band. Her I, I just like carried a a pig's head onto stage and kind of screamed and was real nasty heavy metal. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> wow. You know, something to do on a Thursday night. Oh, I love it. I love All it. All right. Oh, my God. All right, Frank. We love you, buddy. Take love care. Love you, too. Bye-bye. Right. Uh, take care. All right, everybody. Wow, that was just fantastic. So much fun. Fantastic. I had um, a whole bunch of questions I didn't even get to ask. I know, but, but this, this is how it goes, right? Yeah. They, you know, Frank's so good at just sort so of putting good. it out there. So fun. Yeah. So honest. Yeah. So oh. authentic. So authentic. Yeah. We got to give away the regifter. Oh, shoot. We got to give that painting away. Y'all hanging on for that. All yeah. Right. And I haven't even noticed how many people actually joined it, yeah, but I'm just going to fire up the whole engine here. Yeah, let's see. All right. We are going to pick a winner on the regifter. And for some reason, oh, yeah, there we go. Why won't it let me pick a winner? It's saying no candy. This thing's been behaving funky. Huh. That's not. Oh, I know why. I figured out why we can't do the regifter. <laughs> Because there's only one person entered. <laughs> only one person wants it. Only one person Come wants the regifter. <laughs> well, it did run down. We did tell everybody. We did tell everybody. Therefore, tonight's winner. By default. By default of the regifter is Pumpkin Audrey. Pumpkin Yay! Audrey, you are going to be signed over that painting. <laughs> We're giving it to you. Awesome. I yes. think that's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, One Good King is here. Good to see you, One Good King. 63, thanks for coming. Salt and Pepper, 75, thanks for hanging out. Um, Wendy Letvin, good to see you as see always. You. Uh, 63, I said already. Pumpkin Audrey, uh, everybody that's here. Jess and John Park, thank you so much. Mom, thank you so much. Good to see every single one of you. Uh, Pumpkin Audrey's like, I'll be, be right, right over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so. episode 69. In, in the, the books. books with Frank Holiday. Yes. Uh, do we have anything to tell everybody? Hey, by the way, great show coming up in a couple of weeks. We've got some live artists coming. Next week, we've got the, the uh, end of the year show. But after that, we have got Rudy Shepard coming on on January 4th. We have got Madeline Schwartzman coming on on January 11th. And we have got our very own Glenn Lavertu, who's going to be having a show in Connecticut, coming on January 18th. So we have got stuff booked way out great stuff to come so please give a follow and we will see you all next week everybody take care cheers cheers